Thank you, Chris. Hey, Amanda. Hey. Thank you for, hey, for shaking my cage. Uh, so we're going to start out the meeting. So let me start with the um, uh, the beginning of the meeting. Uh, good evening. As chair of the Facilities Advisory Committee, I'm declaring that an emergency exists and I'm invoking the provisions of the RSA 91A23B. Federal, state, and local officials have determined that gatherings of 10 or more people pose a substantial risk to our community and its continuing efforts to combat the spread of COVID-19. In concurring with these determinations, I also find that this meeting is imperative to the continued operation of town government and services, which are a vital part of public safety and confidence during this emergency. As such, this meeting will be conducted without a quorum of this, of this body physically present in the same location. At this time, I also welcome members of the public accessing the meet, this meeting remotely. Even though this meeting is being conducted in a unique manner under unusual circumstances, the usual rules of conduct and decorum apply. So we're gonna start out with doing our roll call attendance, uh, which each member will state their name uh, and then whether there was anybody else in the room. And we're gonna start with Amanda. Amanda Kelly, uh, no one else here. Uh, Chris Weeks. Hi, Chris Weeks. I'm here um, and all by myself. Uh, Peter Lennon. Uh, Peter Lennon here. Uh, you couldn't pay people to be in my room now at this point. <laughs> and Mark Layton. Mark Layton and I am by myself in this room. And uh, Robert Corson and I am uh, by myself in this room. No animals or anything. I. Uh, for our agenda, again, I just wanted to go back through. I don't, I think we're, are we caught up on meeting minutes, Peter? Uh, I think we have to technically, I think, no, I think we did approve those. I'll, I'll yep. check. Um, I think we approved the ones from the walkthrough for the library and that was the last ones and those have been posted. Yeah, we had one for um, September 8th. I, I'm not certain we, um, not certain we approved that one. So we approved. Yeah, I think I. Uh, right. So that, that, uh, that's the one from. From the walkthrough. Sorry, no, no. At the walkthrough, we approved something. Correct. Yeah. No, that, well, the, yeah, that must have been that must have been the one. Sorry. So everybody should then, I guess, have the library walkthrough. Yep. Um, and that's the only one that remains to be approved. Okay. Sorry, I lost the bubble. Has, uh, has everybody reviewed the um, minutes from the our walkthrough of the library? I think so. When, when did you send those, Peter? Uh, I believe I sent those uh, the I either sent them to Rob or I sent them to everybody the second. Friday before I left. So that would have been the second. I mean, I can, I can send it, if you want me to, I can send it <coughs> to you now, Chris, if you haven't had a chance to see it. I don't recall it and I can't find it quickly. So if you'd like to send it, yeah, sure. Okay. I can't imagine there's too All much right. to quibble about on that one. Um, so as we're going through that, we'll we'll give an opportunity to peruse that, and maybe at the we'll re uh, relook at that at the, our new business section of okay. today. Um, on the agenda again, I just wanted to. Uh, I believe everything is is set for the our RFP. I don't know if, if that's just not going to go out. Russ, do, do you have an update on that, or is there something you're missing that we need to provide for that? Um, no, at this point, I think we're in pretty good shape. Dave and I connected on it. Uh, I want to say like a week and a half ago. Uh, it's just been super busy lately, but we have, I asked Dave to create a map 
um, and also just kind of refine the facilities listing to make sure we included what we wanted to include in it. So those were sort of the appendices, but I think it's in pretty good shape to go out at this point. Great, excellent. Yeah. Um, so I, I, one of the, the items that we'll cover both for the, um, will be on the public safety and the DPW complex. Um, so I, is any uh, updates on the, the cupola, Russ? How's that going? Uh, judging by the beeping that's going on daily outside my office, it's driving me crazy about uh, every day. So I think they're making good progress, but it yeah. is a longer than anticipated project at this point. But it's going, it's going good. It's a good group that's working on it. So progress is progress is uh, being made. Right. Is it is it longer? Go ahead, Peter. Russ, when you say it's longer, is that just because they found more corrosion when they opened it up? Um, yes, I do think that is the case. And uh, I can send you uh, some emails about that. Look at that. I have the chance. I'll oh, wow. pass those along. Nice drone. Great. Huh, that's cool. They found that Lady Liberty was facing the wrong way. Did they really? Joker serious. I'm just kidding. Come on. Um, that's better than anything I can talk about. So no, that's great. That's perfect. Good. Remarkable. Yeah, the wave looked at the wave. Oh, he's got his. Uh, his harness on. Um, <laughs> maintenance projects, uh, I, I guess we have the list from this summer, which I don't think probably has changed significantly. And whether we have a list that's actually up for uh, review for the BRC. Whether yeah, and I wanted that or not. I yeah, I just wanted to mention that. I mean, I, I, it goes without saying that you guys know that the BRC has been presented with a list of maintenance projects for 2021. And I know the DPW subcommittee has been working with, uh, with the department on that. So, you know, I, I guess what I'll, what I'll throw out there at you is that where, you know, the whole question about where this fits in the whole uh, facilities condition assessment financially how that fits into the picture is sort of an open question at this point and I just you know not to not to you know not to put a wet blanket on anything I just want to make sure that everybody understands there's a list of projects that they've come up with and then we're about to issue this RFP with really no sort of financial backing behind it so I'll just kind of leave it there when you guys want to talk about it and try to figure out what you think is best <laughs> let me know and you know, we'll certainly pass the word along, but I think that has to be part of the conversation. Okay. So is that something we need to reach out to Jennifer about or what's, what's the process for that? My suggestion, Rob, is that just, you know, I know Bob Kelly, who's the chair of our BRC is yep. aware of it. Um, so my, my suggestion is maybe U.S. chair of the facilities committee reach out to Bob and have a conversation with him about that and then kind of see what the two of you think. And then we can circle back as far as like the overall budget picture and see where it fits. Yeah, that's kind of ties, that into, ties into those other two items. So uh, mm -hmm. the uh, public safety and the DPW complex portion. Um, yeah. Nothing really obviously to report on uh, Rain's Farm. I did have a, a brief conversation with Don Brizzleton the other day. And uh, it's one of the things that we had asked them about, which is, you know, coming up with some sort of long range, you know, some sort of vision for the, for the, for it. And um, sounds like they've started some work on that. Um, I think it's more just internal to their group. I don't know if they've reached out to any of the community members for that or not. Um, so, and then the other ones really are uh, c connecting back with obviously the other committee's budget, energy and sustainability. Um, so just as it's a, it's a good lead into 
I had a conversation with um, Bob Kelly last week. Oh God, yeah, a week, about a week and a half ago now, and um, uh, really is with that kind of starting to think about how we cross coordinate with between our committee and uh, budget recommendations committee. And so I think the, the intent is, is that um, figuring out how we actually get, do that. What's the mechanism? How many people do we, do we want to um, work, you know, across committees, whether it's just a small group, a couple of people from our committee working with a small group from the budget recommendations committee uh, as a, as an idea, as a concept uh, to begin to kind of work through similar similar items that uh, we talked about, which is, has to do with the maintenance projects and any of these other uh, larger projects. Um, so I'd like to have a discussion about, I know we've discussed it before uh, with this idea of kind of bringing people together to serve to advise on uh, either, you know, projects or budget related items uh, and then figure out do we want to uh, convene the entire committee, a portion of the committee uh, to coordinate with the, maybe initially with the BRC. Any thoughts? Rob, what type of coordination would, do we need with the BRC though, I guess? I mean, what, is it just uh, listening to what they're working on? I mean, it's... So I think part of the, the coordination is, is that uh, how it kind of came up was is that they're looking at the, uh, our potential recommendation for both the public works garage as well as the, the public safety and then really not being on the same, um, same, at the same point on the value, how much money is, uh, is being, we're, we're recommending and scope and things like that. So uh, they're, they're currently thinking that, that those numbers should be a lot less. And um, so I think that's, the, that's the, the process. So is to kind of let them know what some of our, our thinking was, how we got to kind of that value and, and why we did. Okay. So it's more on, on project or detailed specific items that they're that they're reviewing and that we're reviewing and trying to be coordinated with that. I get it. Okay. Yes. Yep. So that the recommendation that goes out is a little bit more of a coordinated recommendation versus just you know we recommend something and then they recommend something and then somebody else recommends something different. So. Um, yeah, I mean, part of it's a timeline, right? As far as when, you know, what Russ mentioned this before about what the process is and do we, are we before the BRC? Are we concurrent happening at the same time as BRC? The other thing is the maintenance list. Has anybody seen the proposed maintenance list for 2021? Uh, not as of yet. I haven't either. So I don't know, Russ, if we could get a copy of that and just so we're informed of what projects, maybe it's the same as the list from 2020 and just I'll reach out to Bob and have him give us a send us a copy of what he's what he's reviewing and what their thoughts are, so we can. Help. Yeah, if yeah. you give me a second, I'll um, Rob. I'll. I'll bring oh, can it you up. pull it up? Yeah, I think That'd so. Yeah, nothing like so, real time. Hey, you know we're rocking and rolling here these days. So here is the list. Um, this is 2021's list, and it's 105,000 dollars. Obviously, I'm not prepared to speak in any level of detail to yep. these tonight, but th this is what's going on with the uh, uh, the DPW subcommittee and the, the uh, Public Works Department as far as what they're contemplating for a plan. I'm trying to move it, but my uh, I'm trying to scroll right with but my screen's getting a little dicey on me, so um, Hopefully you can see some of the detail behind that. Yep. But anyway, these are the projects. So the train station re replace the roof at the train station. 
uh, renovate Parks and Rec, the second floor. That's a pretty straightforward project. If you've been in that building, you know that it needs work. Talks about the flooring and the ductless splits with that. You got the public safety complex with the police department side win uh, windows and the entrance side roof. Town hall renovations at the room of the rear, uh, the room at the rear of the gallery, including paint, flooring, carpet. Uh, you guys remember pre-COVID when we could go in the, into the town hall, there was still work to be done in that particular area that's been uh, not done. And then HVAC improvements uh, in the town office, just some expansions of the current HVAC. 15 is pretty minor. Uh, just yep. trying to get that in more, uh, spread more throughout the building evenly. So that's the list. Do you have a, a, a just because I'm seeing the next one, is there a um, is there a delivery date for that ADA study? Yeah, that uh, uh, that yeah, that's a the study's time. completed. Uh, it was then it was just a matter of uh, the firm coming to the select board and kind of presenting it, and that was like right when COVID hit. Yep, and that was kind of one of the things that just kind of got put aside through the pandemic, but it's it's ready to get back up and running at any time. I mean, it has a host of recommendations, totaling a lot of money. Yeah, it would be great to just to, to see that report. I can provide that. Yes. That'd be great. I think that's, um, you know, again, having that uh, as we're trying to cross coordinate, of, you know, th through multiple facilities is, and try to target some of those things and might maybe helpful to say that you know, what areas would, would be the uh, highest um, highest and best use of which ones potentially weren't. Yeah, we're working through that. There's some software too. I, I just remember when I had, I did have a couple of questions of the consultant, um, but it, it uh, let me, that's a good reminder. It's a good reason to get that back up and, and get it going. And I can, I can talk with them uh, soon and uh, should have something buttoned up by our next meeting. Great. So, Rob, can I ask a couple questions on this? You definitely. So, so um, I guess my first question is, is, is what what didn't make the list? I mean, this I'm not arguing that this is a priority, but I guess I'd be curious just to see what is it a second page as far as what what else? I mean, I'm assuming that you guys have a long list, and this is just what's made it to the top. But I guess I'd be curious in seeing that. And some question wouldn't call necessarily you know, adding. You know, a, you know, adding AC to certain places, unless you're replacement, that's it's more of, I'm not sure I'd call some of that stuff maintenance, but, um, but I guess that's my comment. Yeah, I, uh, what I'll do is there was a list that came out, I think, um, I want to say it was early summer. I'll send that along. Uh, was it a larger list? Is that what that was? It was a larger list. Yeah, I'm assuming. I, I'm guessing there is. I'm not questioning it. I just, as far as like to know, you know, what things didn't make it, and um, and you know, we're talking. They're showing, you know, some items being done to buildings that we hope to not have around for a while, maybe potentially, right? So the public safety complex is being twenty thousand being spent on that. Um, and the two big projects this year, obviously, are the town hall. We all know that, and uh, with with the cupola and the and the work that's being done there, and the uh, retrofitting of the public safety complex to allow for uh, female um, showers and bathroom, you know, separate bathrooms for uh, public safety personnel, female firefighters, and so forth. So that's what's been going on with this year's budget so far. So, so Russ, on those, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, you're not, you're, you're, I guess to me that I'd almost call that a program change or, a, you know, a, I wouldn't necessarily call those made that, that a maintenance project, you know, converting those, uh, I think it's a good project that you're required to do it as far as the, you know, getting showers for the female officers and stuff, but you don't, I mean, I, you, you just don't have opportunities to, to fund that anywhere else, I take it. You know, if it, that doesn't seem like it's a maintenance project to me, but you're funding it through this this budget. Correct. It would either be the maintenance project budget or the public safety complex building maintenance budget. So one of one of those two places, and I think the cost I saw. In fact, I just saw a, a uh, 
a, a sum of about 10,000 on that today. So Jeff chose to charge it to the project's budget, not the building maintenance budget for public safety. But we can, right. I mean, we can look at that and see what the, yeah, the delta is. I mean, there. to me, you, you, you have to prioritize, you only have 100,000 or so and, you, and it's intended for maintenance, but you're, you know, you're having to use that to support some of these these things that are, I, would, I mean, it's not maintenance, right? But you're converting spaces to proper use. Um, Smaller I, capital, I would call it. Yeah, I mean, capital improvements versus, I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to get into the word, into the wording of it, but it's just as far as how, you know, you categorize this as, as that maintenance and the, but then you're using it for program improvements or for, um, like I said, change of occupancy or whatever it is, but um so anyways, let's know, just a comment. Any other comments regarding the, this, we started out after, I mean, either on the, the um, maintenance list or, well, we start with the maintenance list. Anybody have any comments about the uh, the or discussion regarding the having some portion or uh, some group meeting with the BRC to, to discuss maintenance projects, public works, and um, the public safety built complex? Um, <laughs> Rob, let me. I mean, I, I'm obviously as a former member of the budget committee, I think it's, as much as we can work with them, the better. Um, and I know this is probably going to sound a little <clears throat> strange coming from me about cutting budgets. Um, but um, I'm not all that uncomfortable with sending what we think to be our best recommendation over to them and more than happy to defend it uh, with them. But if they, in their wisdom, decide they want to spend less money and do something differently other than our recommendations, then as far as I'm concerned, if we're comfortable with our recommendations and our, the amount of money we recommend, hey, they're on their own. We give them our, you know, our two or 10 cents. Uh, we, try, we coordinate as much as possible. We, we share our thinking and what have you. But I don't believe that necessarily total congruency and agreement with the budget committee is uh, necessary. I mean, it's a nice to have, and we'd like to have them support our recommendations and see the wisdom of that. But if they wanna go somewhere else with it, then that's on them. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm gonna be interested in what you say uh, Bob thinks about how he thinks the public safety study ought to get done. But we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about that. We spent a fair amount of time talking about the number. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we started out with between 100 and 150,000 and we bumped it up to 200,000. I think in part, and correct me everybody, I think in part to make Dave and Chief Wilking more comfortable with the amount of money we were gonna leave in the budget, the amount of money we were gonna recommend be left in the budget so that they felt more comfortable that they could still get the work done that we, we and they wanted to do. If the budget committee for a different set of reasons thinks that a lower number is better, then that's on them to try to explain that and justify that. Yep. Um, It sounded like you know, it's was, it was more just a, to have a, to, for us to give a chance to to have the discussions with them, right? So instead of them just taking a letter from us, you know, maybe it's it's just having these conversations with them so they get a better understanding of our approach and and for us too, right? They may have a really good idea or a different opinion, but um, but I think you're right, Peter. I mean, at the end, they have to come up with their recommendation. We came up with ours, but having a dialogue back and forth, it sounds like that's what they're asking, just for for us to have opportunity to explain and for them to have some back and forth, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I think that's all well and good. 
What does that look like, Rob? Is that just a small meeting or is it part of their formal it meetings? A, it would be a small meeting, uh, a sub meeting between the two, you know, again, uh, the number of representatives were, we probably need to discuss what that is and then who it is. Uh, and then just a, you know, a fairly brief review of what our thinking was, what the, what our, why our recommendation, you know, kind of supporting our recommendation uh, and then, you know, giving some background and then a quick discussion about it. Yeah, I'm in favor of that. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that all sounds well and good, but Rob, let me get it. You sounded as if you'd had some sense from them. They were talking about a lower number and they were talking about having the town staff do part of the work that we contemplated having this outside contractor do. And, and, and if that's what they, they think, and obviously, you know, we want to hear them out as to why they think that's that's the right way to go. But do you have any insights beyond that as to, or if that's accurate, what I've just said? I think that was the, the discussion I had was uh, fo primarily focused on the idea of getting together to have this, you know, to share those same, same things, Peter, is why we came up with the number we came up with what we see is the, the scope of work and then who does what portion of that scope of work uh, so that um, in, in the brief discussion, there was this talk about that the, the idea that the department heads would need to uh, pull, pull some weight and put, be um, very much engaged in the project and not just give it to somebody else to do. Um, I would never be an advocate of just giving it to a department and not or giving it to somebody else to do that is really ultimately needs to be integrated in with a department and you're using the resources to um, one help get the work done because I, th I still think there's a fair amount of work that that needs to happen but so that was that was the thought Peter. Mm -hmm. Well I, I agree that department heads ought to be involved in some way shape or form. And you don't obviously send the whole product over to some third party uh, without any communication between the two and without them getting the third party getting the information from the department heads. But if we're looking for a relatively speaking objective analysis or an objective feasibility analysis of alternatives and an objective um, a feasibility study, I think it's, un it's unfair to put that burden on the town staff um, because they're not in the best position to, to provide that kind of perspective um, as much as they are smart and talented and capable. But anyway, that's a discussion we can have with the BRC. So, um, yeah, I, it definitely. So, I'm, I, again, just to kind of follow up on that portion of it, I um, sent along kind of a draft of, uh, kind of an outline draft of uh, RFP information that I've been involved in for um, development projects in, in again, site selection, uh, feasibility, and testing a project to make sure that it's ready for prime time. So, um, yeah, so it's, thank, thank you, Russ. Yeah. Uh, really, and obviously, you know, from what I gathered from the report, that there would be potentially multiple sites to be evaluated, uh, and then so that's one thing. You have multiple sites, including the the current current site. Um, when it comes down to program review, uh, one of the things I you know again pulling from the report was the idea that the uh, level of service for both police, fire, health, and emergency preparedness, um, their staffing, what is their staffing model, what is the, the, what do they need to support that level of service, uh, and then what are the shared services that would be between the two departments um, that could programmatically be shared. I see a lot of that work in the upfront is uh, both a combination of the department heads 
and somebody facilitating and pulling together the data that's associated with um, making those decisions. Uh, and then when it comes down to the facility options, that is where you begin to uh, summarize the program into kind of building components. Uh, you evaluate the current facility um, based upon some of those programmatic ideas. Uh, and then you really go through the, what I see is kind of three different options, a renovation and addition of the existing facility, a new facility with combined services and a new facility with separated program. Um, then I see a you know, community participation piece, which we discussed, uh, an independent cost estimate, and then what the deliverables would be for that, that particular part of the project. So if, it doesn't have to be done now, but it'd be great for, you know, just, just as we're going through these things, think about some other items or um, that we may want to include. Uh, I, I looked at obviously the, whether we're adding in, so a lot of the ones I'm doing now actually include a sustainability portion. Um, they include uh, financial, uh, basically long-term um, operational costs, things like that. And whether that's something we want them to do or not, uh, or, or does this give us enough to be able to, to bring to the town uh, and really have a fleshed out project that has a budget, has a site, and has a building. Rob, can I can I offer some comments? Yeah, definitely. So thank you for putting this together. I think it, it's really good. I just have a couple questions. Um, the part about the site evaluation, <laughs> and does that, I mean, should that happen after the feasibility study? Or, I mean, the way I was reading this, that that was, you were proposing this, that be done first, but I'm just wondering, is, does that happen um, a little bit later after the feasibility studies to see which site is makes the mix, I guess, or? I, I would say that if uh, it, it could, I think, um, one of the things I see is on that one would be is that may make a decision about whether you're separating the two programs or not separating the two programs. Um, so if the police goes somewhere, fire goes somewhere. Uh, so you having the site selection as part of your, and then whatever the cost of developing those actually needs to be rolled up into that cost estimate at the end. Okay, so you, so it's basically we have limited sites, so the consultant is going to look at those sites, develop yep. the needs for those, to, and then and then can knows enough that they can develop it for whatever the whatever options is. Yeah. Okay, I get so it. Most of the stuff would be fairly fairly simple as far as it, you know the uh, background. The biggest one probably would be doing the phase one environmental. Um, so that's probably the biggest one, and then if there's any survey information uh, that's either on record or is available or needs to be created. Okay. The other I question, Oops, sorry, go ahead. I don't know if we would need the geotech at this stage or not. I guess it depends. Um, Mark, I, do you wanna make your comment? Cause I wanted to do a step back and just ask Dave and Russ, like what sites are on the table for this? Well, I mean, I think that's a good point. Maybe there's maybe there's an initial site evaluation, and then there's a follow up site evaluation because yeah. the geotech evaluation is going to get expensive, um, especially with borings. So maybe that's maybe there's a you know, that should be a second phase. A, that can be SD once they move to SD, then then they could do it then. Yeah, yeah and that that could actually be just covered as a as a uh, allowance item in the in the cost estimate too. So definitely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you should have, it's probably on here, but you know, just the wetland evaluations and stuff, but that's boundary survey. The, um, so under the program review, is that, are they, are they gonna be reviewing the program or are they gonna be developing the program? I mean, the- I think they're gonna be, so how I see the program review uh, would be that they need to pull a lot of the data that they uh, talked about in the, uh, in the report and a lot of that data, one of the biggest things I noticed in that report was the number of um, uh, false alarms 
the number of false alarms was huge. So I think part of this is really mining the data and then for them to build what their, the other thing they talked about was a staffing model specifically for fire, uh, having to do with what types of vehicles they're gonna roll for different events. And that in a lot of places they were rolling different. So instead of right, doing both a fire truck and an ambulance to, a, to an ambulance call, uh, other, other uh, recommendations were that you look at just rolling another vehicle, uh, you know, a similar size, smaller vehicle, just in cases of uh, a, um, just a support, which would change your staffing. So who would make that decision on this though? Is that the consultant or is that, I mean, how are they going to, to know what to use? I think that the consultant would, and I think that's the, that would be the data that would be given to the department heads to really begin to say, for the level of service that we want to, we think that the town of Exeter needs, this is what we need to support that level of service. And these are the okay. teams we need to support that level of service. And these are vehicles that we need to support that level of service. And with all that information, that begins to build, you know, how many staff are on each day, how many, you know, how many are on, on, on site, how many vehicles are on site, what other storage and other items do they need within the, uh, that area as well. So, so I just, that's why I'm just trying to, as far as what that, what service the consultant's providing. I mean, they're basically going to take the data from a report, work with Russ and the police chief and the fire chief and say, you know, they define that goal, that level of service, and then how the space will meet those needs then, I yeah. guess, right? So they're just taking that, in, that those decision points and incorporating. Yeah, and, I, you know, and you're giving somebody the task to figure out um, what is the cause, root cause of all of the false alarms. Are they from businesses? Are they from residences? And uh, when I, you the know. Academy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it. It's from the it, academy. No, I think actually it, it, yeah. it, 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 it could be. So the reality is yeah. some of these things, if you yeah. really think about it, you could, you could go and work with different institutions and say, hey, by the way, we're getting a lot of false alarms in blank, blank, blank. And you could actually come up with some solutions that would reduce the false alarms, which would reduce your, you know, your call volume and reduce a lot of the uh, trips. So. Right. Okay. So Mark, we just, I, was, I was thinking I, some of the same things you were, Mark. And uh, I, I guess I was thinking or assuming the town could come up with some of this information too. Like we have the report, which gives staffing, I think current and also projected staffing levels. Is that correct? Yeah, I was just, I, I could add to that just by saying the, uh, yeah, the, the reports are both um, excellent as far as providing a framework for how to evaluate our next steps. So I just yeah. spent at 4.30 to 6 tonight, I was actually on a call with Mark Pyland and Joe Pazzo and Eric Wilking and Justin Pison talking about different particulars relative to the staffing issues that the fire uh, study identifies, the fire EMS study identifies. So, um, you know, one of the major themes that comes through that is what is the community's sort of appetite, if you will, to mitigate its risk to the degree and within the framework that they're talking about. And I found the framework to be extremely solid in the metrics that they're using to assess the risk, but the decisions, as they said in the report, are all local decisions. Right. So yep. ultimately, we are going to be the ones that make those determinations. So as far as the facility goes, my suggestion is have to have CPSM still around in some tangible way, which I think they are agreeable to doing. And actually, we talked about tracking just the calls by year and kind of helping us get into that mode of like producing this data set every year and making it hopefully easy to do. Uh, the initial extraction was a little painful, but hopefully if we progress, we can create a system that will allow to create that data set each year so we can trend it. But they will also be able to stand by and work with, I think, an architect to uh, marry the studies to the facility plan in such a way that it makes sense for everybody. So hopefully that makes sense. They do, you know, I want to make sure that everybody understands they put a plan together for the town 
So this is not something that we need to do tomorrow. It's not something that we need to staff up to eight overnight in each of the shifts on fire, if that's what we're talking about, or the minimum staffing tomorrow. But what they're saying is that if you want to get away from your cross staffing model, which they're recommending because of forecasted growth in the town and other things, that these are the steps to take to operationally get away from that. So that's, that's kind of the, the basic premise behind how they've approached this uh, in their analysis. So I think it's really great because they took the calls and sort of turned it inside out to the, you know, to the framework of the, of the community and then said, based on the standards, this is what we see applying the standards. But again, we're not going to make the decisions for you locally. You're going to make them in evaluating all this information in context. Right. So hopefully that makes sense. But though I see the consultants kind of being on standby throughout this process to kind of assist us and say, yep, you're headed in the right direction or, oh, you may want to think about this because this is what we saw. So I'll just leave that there for now. That was the <laughs> outcome of a very long meeting today talking to them about those issues. Yep, that's consistent. Yeah. The other part about the program that I see the design consultant would be they're going to flush out, you know, square foot requirements for all the program and space areas. So even though the, uh, the study that we have now is really good on staffing, uh, we still need a design consultant to say, okay, the fire needs a break room of this size, 600 square feet, workout room of 800 square feet. Um, you know, 15,000 square feet of garage space, something like that. So that's, that's where I see the design consultant developing the program. They'll give us the size and the number of all those elements we need in the building. And that's what they can use as they evaluate each site to, to try to fit all those pieces onto uh, each site. Yeah, that's cool. so Chris, that was that that number three, starting at number three really was the, you know, taking that information and actually creating a, square foot and volumetric uh, programmatic um, yeah. to be used for space planning and, and uh, things like that. Yeah, I have a, I have a question guys from a non-architect point of view. Um, if, I mean, doesn't a program review and the staffing levels, the, the, the plan to get over time to whatever staffing levels people think the, the town may or may not accept or whatever option of staffing levels there are, doesn't that drive everything else? Yep. I mean, <laughs> how does the, how does the department, you know, how does the design consultant know how big a break room he's going to put in or she's going to put in unless he know she or he knows how many people are going to be using it at any given time. That's why um, actually, Peter, that's why number two comes before number three. So number two would really be pulling the data together that would just, that would tell you about, how many people are there? Uh, what what are yeah, shared, what are not shared services? Okay, I understand. Yeah, but I'm what I'm trying to say is why doesn't pro why doesn't number two come before number one and three? Uh, yeah, number I one mean, could be number one. Could That's be number what one. What? Well, I it wanted to get come, get from it could be happening concurrently. Yeah. Well, I don't want. I mean, if I guess. And maybe we, I had a, a more simplistic view of what the feasibility study was going to do. And I, of course, I'm going to defer to you guys as the experts on that. But, but if, if we want the, the outside consultant, and I don't mean CPSM, and I certainly agree with you, Russ, they need to be, be available and hooked in to whatever the feasibility study and analysis of alternatives is, is doing. Um, but it, it I, I, I don't understand how you can't, I don't understand why program review, the way you guys have described it, isn't the bedrock of everything else. And meaning even of the site evaluation. I mean, how, I mean if, we, if we know what the staffing model is, then we know what sites, or, or they're gonna be able to talk about some sites being better than others, so, and some facilities options being better than others let me, based let me, on the program. Let me go back to this quickly, Peter. If, if there are sites that you've already identified, this is basically just pulling together the background information on each of those sites so that when you do get to the point where you understand 
the size of the building based upon the physical program, um, then you can actually test, you can go back to those sites and you can sit there and say, yes, these sites uh, meet that next criteria, which is they do fit the program on that site. So that's why there's a site test fit on each of those, uh, those scenarios. So the idea would be is you have to go back and test each site based upon your, your uh, program analysis and uh, location. Got it. That makes sense. Russ, and I apologize for my ignorance on this. Um, did they identify actual sites in their alternatives in the, in the CPSM study? I thought they kind of said, well, there's, you know, here's a geographic quadrant, northeast, southwest, whatever, of the town, central location of the town. Did they actually get down to sites specific? Uh they gave it an option A, B, and C, and they did not get into absolute specific sites. Okay. Russ, do you know, do you have any ideas for potential sites? Like how many are we realistically thinking of? Well, it's more, it's more of a, <laughs> it's more of a situation of, I, I think one of our initial stages, and we can all collaborate on this together is, figuring out, you know, what is available. I mean, obviously we have the Epping Road site that's 2.05 acres and that was acquired back in 2007, I believe. Um, so that is out there. We have the current public safety complex site, obviously. Um, and what, once you get beyond that, I mean, it's not like we have upland sites that are in, I think it's option C, I'd have to bring the study up to look at it up, but we don't have sites available in that area. So we would have to put out the word that we were interested in purchasing property in that area if we wanted to go with option C. So there aren't a lot, can't think of, you know, a lot that are upland. I think there are parcels that are privately owned that I think maybe as part of the strategy of how we go about this, we put the word out to people that we're looking for. Once we can get to a certain stage in this process where we're comfortable with what we'd like to do based on the program and what makes the most sense. We ought to evaluate, does it make sense to put something out there and say, look, you know, we're interested in properties in the Southeast corner of the town. If there's anybody willing to step up to the plate and assist us with that, we'll give it six months or whatever. I mean, that's a long time. <laughs> I don't know what the right time is, but those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about that we may at least take a stab at and solicit and may, you know, who knows, maybe we, we come up with somebody that would be willing to, um, you know, it could be anything, right? Somebody retires and owns three acres of land and they, they don't mind you demolishing their house. If you're going to put a public safety facility on the site for the benefit of the town. I mean, it's a possibility. I, I don't know what the odds are, but we could try that. Just trying to be creative with some of the options because I think one of the things that consultants have done is they've really sort of drilled down on where the activity is and they've given us that map. And I think we ought to at least take a fair shot at trying to take advantage of what they've given us and evaluate those options in context. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes. yep. So the, that does bring up to another thing that probably should be on the list of items, which would be is an independent um, uh, assessment to be done on the property so that there's a, a if it's a, uh, somebody else owns it, is, what is the value of that property as an, as an assessment piece. So an appraisal or land acquisition yep. type yep. of, yeah. It sounds to me kind of, like based on everything Russ just said, that it does make more sense that program review would really have to be first if there's potential sites that aren't even identified yet. We have two identified sites and then who knows what might come out of the woodwork when the bat call is put out for more sites. It seems like we'd just be looping back to step one again. Or are they concurrent? They could be concurrent. I think the reality is, is that the site evaluation, these are, again, part of this is a scope of work. So understanding what has to get done, that somebody needs to do the work. That's one item. When it happens is as we, as you create a project plan, 
these may shift slightly where they are, but in general, you need to know what what the criteria of, or for the site is, what potential development costs there are with the site, if there's a purchase price that's with the site. Uh, otherwise, you could use a uh, budget number, which is never a great thing. <laughs> you could say, oh, the site's worth $2 million. Or it's worth yeah, a million. You just, yeah, you would just decide to be determined and you just put it, you just put a number in for an allowance. Exactly. What the, what the purchase price would be, but exactly. you know, so, the development of that. But the, um, but you, like you said, Rob, is that, that number one, you haven't listed as number one, but it's, it can happen concurrently with the program review and it could happen later in the, if, if a, a different site's developed, right? It's just, it's a scope of work. It's a piece that could, that you should be identified to get a number, a cost for it, a fee, but it could be happening, may not happen, right? I mean, we may not. May not. We may, as we go through this and say, you know, it doesn't make sense to, to build a new one or something like that, but, uh, um, or whatever. So, sorry, man. I think I'd like to move program review to the first step and just rearrange it a little. And then I guess I'm envisioning like part after the program review, in addition to the site evaluation, they also have to evaluate the options pretty quickly. Um, as far as, you know, do they stay co-located together or we split them up? Uh, you know, they'll have to figure that out pretty quickly. Oh, I have yeah, a definitely. question on the program review. When we're talking about potential increases to the number of staff and changing the schedule, would that be something that has to go before the voters separately? Expanding the... Well, I mean, I think, you know, as I've been thinking about this, I'll just tell you that if you're talking about, you know, right now we have two shifts of seven firefighters and two shifts of six, right? So your construction, you're really going to construct the facility if you're talking just about talking just about shifts to seven or eight, right? So that's going to be your, that's going to be your basic framework for the, for the fire EMS side. Um, so from a facility perspective, whether you actually fund those positions through the budget or not, you're going to build your facility or plan your facility to accommodate the eight that we're talking about, right? Uh, police is going to be a little bit different, but the same roadmap. You're going to look at the study. You're going to look at what the recommendations are. You're going to, going to make a commitment based upon what the recommendations are to a certain type of facility. And then you may end up backfilling that over a period of time, just depending upon the operating budget constraints and whether, you know, what is your plan over three years, five years, you're going to get, get your, get your plan fulfilled, but you are going to build your facility with your plan in mind. Yeah. That, that would be the way I would think about this. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. So Rob, can I, can we jump to the, the feasibility study section that yep. you have? I just have a question for that. Um, also, Dave is here, by the way, too. Just to, I don't want to take all his air time. Sorry, Mark. He wants no, to weigh okay. in on something. Yeah, we're trying. We're trying to keep Dave silent. That's why we're trying. To... <laughs> <laughs> Want to give him some props? I know he's here. Yeah. <laughs> so the um, just a quick question on. And I mean, I agree with what you have for the options. I, th I think there. So my question is: Is there? Um, what, what about you have the number three new facility with separated program, but under that option, it would also be reusing the existing facility, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Or, um, so I uh, guess, what, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Okay. So, so the issue would be is, is that if you, if you, if you were to evaluate, you know, the idea of, uh, Say you're going to build two new, two new smaller buildings, and not renovate that building as a okay. station or fire station. So that's a good question. I think it's a great. I I, I struggle with that one on my own because uh, I could see that the um, the amount of rework you have to do to that existing building to make it efficient, to do all the stuff you need to do it, and to bring it to compliance with energy code, and to do all the other stuff. Uh, is it better to do something different with that building? 
So, so that's a good point. So I would, so I would say that the, the number one renovations slash additions to existing facility, maybe it makes sense just to say to, to hold both programs or just one program or something like right. that. Just, good one. just to clarify that it could be for two, could be for both fire and exit uh, police, or it could just be for one of them under the existing. Um, that's a good one. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I wasn't actually thinking that that we would have two separate facilities, new facilities for, but um, it makes you, you got a good point. I mean, I just think it from a phasing standpoint and from a, you know, continuity of service and uh, cost. Yeah, I think it should be evaluated. I think that's a really good um, option to, to bounce against these other ones. That's good. And just another clarifying point, and I know this is just an outline, but the independent cost estimate just, I mean, we're going to have one for each option, right? Yep. Yes. Good, yep. Yeah, and then as far as the community participation, um, I guess I would envision once they come up with, you know, two or three of the best options, we could present those to the public. Um, you know, get their feedback on that, and then they could do a, a subsequent meeting with the preferred option to introduce the preferred option. Yeah, I would this towards um, numbers at that meeting. What's that, Amanda? I feel okay. like at the community meetings, you're going to get a lot of questions on how much does each one cost. Well, that should be part of the, the pre presentation, so. Dave, you gonna say something? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, cause the, thank you for this first of all, cause I was gonna, I envisioned as we talked kind of taking this and the 200,000 wasn't really because I don't know if I felt comfortable or not. It was just that no one seemed to know what, you know, the feasibility study and what we wanted would cost. So then it was determined we get a scope of work and then I can shop this around and see what it would cost. I guess my, I guess my questions are: is we would go through like site evaluation, like you know, like other people mentioned that would we go through site evaluation on a site we're not going to build on? It it seems like you almost get to an al, you know preferred alternative. You look at sites and then you get to a preferred alternative, and you dig down and do something like a, I mean, an Alta survey is like the Cadillac of surveys. It says boundary survey Alta. I'd, I don't even know if you need an ALTA, but to do an ALTA survey on three sites seems uh, seems a, a lot, uh, doesn't seem needed. And like several of these I could do in-house, like the deed research, zoning review, plan review, I, I can do those sort of things. We don't need... Uh, so the, the only reason the ALTA is on there, just, just quickly, Dave, is that if, if you, during your deed search, if you found anything that was uh, suspect, that's all, that's, and you okay. wouldn't have to do it on all three. I agree. Definitely. Yeah, and I was guess I was looking at like, okay, the although there might be a third option in a site we don't know about, I we have a lot of familiarity with the with the town owned sites, um, so I, I'm not sure we'd need you know to do a lot there. But I, I would look to go out and and I really like you know basically two and well wait a minute, you have did you just renumber? Can you go back up? <laughs> Oh, okay. Two became. <laughs> wow! Somebody, yeah, good job. <laughs> so I, I don't know. And then to to what Chris was saying, I, I I see this as like you're going exploring three, and then you're kind of presenting all three and what they cost, but then you're kind of stopping there. I I would hope that it would went to a preferred alternative. You chose a preferred alternative, and you dig down into site evaluation a little bit more to get a firm number on the uh, on the preferred alternative before you move to the next step. So maybe so, so yeah, you're just a, go ahead, bro. I was just going to say I, I'm kind of working through this, but like preferred alternative preferred alternative ends up somewhere in here. Yeah, I, I would just add to what Ron said before is that sometimes you know if, if before you get too far, if there's something that on that site that is really cost prohibitive or something that is that you, you it was your preferred site until you start doing that site assessment and then all of a sudden it's cost prohibitive and that's not your preferred site anymore. So you know what I mean? So I think that there's, 
there's definitely, when you're reviewing the, the site options, there's definitely got to be some sort of initial or interim evaluation on things like that, right? So you're not going to pick a site that's going to cost a million dollars to get water to, right? Just because it's in a great spot, you're going you're gonna to figure that out a little bit in the beginning that, you know what, it's, you know, that site's not a deal because it's going to cost a million dollars to get water to it. So, well, I guess what I was saying, yeah, I agree with that. But I always guess I was saying I don't need a. Con I don't think with our expertise here in the town, we need a consultant to tell us that. Okay. In house, given the two sites that we already know, and given the expertise in house, we can do most of that. We can we can determine whether a site has you know the fatal flaws or not. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, you, I mean, the, there's data available. We're very familiar with the two sites that we own and other town-owned sites. So, so Dave, Dave, maybe it's just, it's not necessarily, it's, it's incorporating a site evaluation. And so, I mean, some of these things you're, done, you're doing yourself, but it's incorporating that site evaluation into the report, right? So Correct. That's what I, I was looking at it from going out and getting yeah. it from a consultant. And yeah. I probably kind of drop some of this stuff that we could do in-house and not ask them for a number on because my yeah. immediate goal, short-term goal, is to get this, get a number, and then get to the CIP and revise that CIP number with Chief Wilkin and, you know, if needed, and, and be as accurate as possible to get. Yeah. Yep. So just one comment on the, on the uh, community input, I can't remember what it was called, but um, what was it called there? Community participation assistance. So, I mean, I think that the uh, commu two community information events is, is one step, but I would also, I would piggyback off what Dave you did for the camp, your um, town master planning and, and the work that you did there. And, I mean, there's more outreach than just having community events, right? Yeah. I mean, there's other things that can happen. So I mean, I would just leave that as, as a, um, as, as assistance with it. But there's multiple ways, I guess. To, I mean, again, Dave, you can you can wordsmith this when you do your RFP. But I, but I would just propose that there's more than just having a community information events because sometimes those don't get well attended. So or most of the time. Yeah, I think a project website is a must and, and the design consultants would and the town would be available to um, answer questions. And I think it's helpful to document, you know, uh, resident questions and then provide uh, written responses to them. And you can post that on the project website as well. So I agree, Mark, there's, there's yeah. more to it than just a, a couple of meetings. Yeah, I and mean, Dave does as well. I mean, I would say like social media, right? You put the, you know, all the different ways to get feedback from town residents, but also just to, to promote what the needs are. I mean, I think there's going to be a communication effort to this that really sh people know that, you know, why are you doing this? Um, so, and not that the consultant needs to do that, but as far as just to, what needs to happen, I think. Looks pretty good. Yeah, the geotech we probably don't need in this step. Yeah, schematic design that could happen. And then part of the deliverables, Rob, what do you think about like saying uh, architectural base drawings for, you know, cost estimating purposes? And it wouldn't be much. It just like, we, we use the term base drawing because that way you're, you're kind of showing floor plans. Yeah. Well, yeah. What do you use in your, what I just had is it is uh, at the bottom is basically uh, d design narratives. Oh, building plans. Okay. Yeah. Building plans, design narratives, and then, you know, s some renderings. Yeah. Yeah. And the expectation, Russ and Dave, is the, the plans won't be that well developed. It'll basically be some envelope dimensions and the narratives will discuss what the materials of the construction will be and what the systems will be. Yeah. A lot of it will really just approve the concepts, right? Just to show that it that it's that it can meet the program and that it, you know give it an idea of, of the intent of uh, whether it's a renovation or if it's a new building but um, yeah. yeah so 
So level of effort, 200,000, still good? I say yes. Uh, I think you put it, it, put it this way. I think if you, you could put $200,000 in the budget, but you don't have to spend $200,000. So you're um, arguing for an hourly rate breakdown versus fixed fee? Is that what you're saying? No, I think I think I would go with a. I think you could get a, a fixed fee. Um, don't you? Especially right now. Oh, I, I think you can. I was just kind of exploring that thought process and no, what your I, thoughts I were. Think based, based upon. Like a not to exceed. Yeah. Yeah. If you do that, they'll work right up to the not to oh, exceed yeah. number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> not, not to exceed miraculously because yeah. that yeah. not to exceed number every time. Yeah. But but you could break it out by by each by each element though, right? So you could have them yeah. provide a, a fee for number and for number three, and, and then that way you'll get a good idea of their of their understanding of the scope. It, when you especially when you have multiple bids, you can compare consultants, right? And you can say if somebody says I can do number three for five thousand, and everybody else is fifty thousand, mm -hmm. you know something's wrong there, right? So um, I would definitely suggest that you get it for each scope. I mean, you guys probably do this for all your stuff, but um, and that way you can just understand their proposed level of effort on that stuff. Yeah, and then yeah, if we usually you, ask. I mean, say, for a pretty detailed budget, not just one number. Uh, we asked yeah. for a line item budget, but my understanding is, is we're, we're, you know, all I was going to do with this at this point was informally get, because I know people I can talk to with this documentation and get a pretty darn accurate number of what we're going to see when, you know, when we go out to bid. So that will be used for the CIP. Uh, so the, the only thing I would include on that, Dave, would be uh, the size of your existing facility, how many square feet currently have, mm -hmm. so that there's a, people have a baseline of understanding whether this is a 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 square foot um, project. So that they, they have a, a general idea about the, the scale. Yeah, I just, I'm just saying, yeah, that great. And, and, and I, to see once the funding comes, then, I mean, I'm not going to be the one, this is not, you know, under planning. So I probably won't be writing the RFP and so forth to actually go out to bid. But I guess my, my involvement was the CIP getting this up and I'd be certainly willing to help and so forth. But I see that as down the road. I see that as, you know, once uh, we secure the funds, then we'd issue the RFP in the spring. Right. Well, so just going back to your timeline too, Dave, just to get, give you an Or maybe, example. maybe early. Yeah. No, no, but just to uh, I would go early. I'm, doing, I'm doing two feasibility studies right now, uh, which is basically from site selection, uh, you know, surveys, geotech, uh, you know, contours, the whole nine yards. We did it by doing a, a an extended uh, charrette. We took three days at the site, three days with the owner. Uh, so we were able to rapidly prototype uh, a number of options um, with the owner and develop the program fairly quickly. And by looking at different ways of actually attacking some of these things, you can actually potentially get this thing done pretty darn quick um, and hit your, hit your CIP budget recommendations committee timeline to get a number into them. That's a more realistic number. Yeah, I thought of that. I thought of that. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I thought of that, like writing it right into the RFP about our timeline. Uh, and then, you know, that's yeah. an expectation up front at the bid, but I wanted to be realistic. I didn't want to, you know, push a time frame that we're not going to get a good product. Well, I think the, if the issue is if you're, if you're um, part of that would be is, is that picking the right, plan attack to get it done. And instead of having somebody come for a day or come for a one meeting for two hours and then leave and then see them in two weeks, you know, we basically went to the site. Uh, we met with them in the morning. We worked for the remainder of the day, we met with them in the afternoon, uh, worked through part of the, the evening, met with them again the next day to work through that day. And then we had a report out after the third day. So 
options to do things well, quicker. Oh, leave your business card. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, sometimes uh, working with various consultants, you know, the time, what they have going on, their workload. It's, I mean, we try to do our best during the interview process to flush that out as to how busy they are and how attentive they will be to us. But you can't always do that. And sometimes, you know, what the timeline is up front doesn't end up in the timeline. Um, oh, yeah, no, I it understood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Rob's not off, off, you know, on a public project, so it's you know just without community input and all the other steps that that we're proposing here. Right, that was that's the private side where you can get things done a lot quicker than the public side. Well, if you look at in this new virtual environment, who knows? Maybe yeah. maybe we're onto something yeah. here. <laughs> so the uh, just like the master plan exercise, you know, where where you do get uh, rapid community input. Uh, and, you know, the, the idea of doing things live is much more realistic now between uh, both software databases and everything else. Literally, you can, you can do a lot of work uh, very quickly. And well, I think you have the advantage of the outreach side for sure, right? I mean, you, you can get a lot more attendance through doing something like this and presenting ideas and, and uh I just I think it's it's right now using this virtual platform, so you, you just have that opportunity to get a lot more to get the information out a lot easier that, and uh, maybe some some better participation that way. We've certainly seen that at school board meetings. I mean, obviously everybody's engaged, but I don't think they used to get anybody at those meetings, and now there's 400 of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, so I'm a little confused, Rob. What's the BRC timeline? for either Dave to meet with his number or for us to meet with our letter. And then again, you know, what do we do with, with a number for our letter? Do we wait until, uh, um, you know, do we wait until Dave, Dave gets a number and we, we noodle on it or, or what? I think the, 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 for us, if we're if we're all in agreement, we want to at least have that conversation with with Bob and the uh, some representatives for the BRC. I'd say that uh, as soon as we can meet with them, have a discussion before the twenty first. And maybe it's Bob and someone from Police Fire Subcommittee, and maybe someone yep. from DPW Subcommittee, something like that. Exactly. Yep. I'll, now that I have this, I, I mean, it's not a lot for me. I mean, it's a, it's a conversation. It's um, a couple, maybe a couple conversations. I hope to have kind of a ballpark number, whether it's, you know, one, you know, generally speaking, 150, 175, 200, you know, in, in that kind of area, not an exact, you know, dollar amount, but right. I, I should have that quickly. I, I, I would suspect I'd have that within a week. So, Russ, that document, you were the one who just edited that, right? Uh, yes, I have it. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody in agreement on that? It, it looked good to me what he found, wound up with. So, that's what Dave can take at this point. Yeah, I think it's a good starting point. Okay. Yeah, and I'll send it around if you want to tweak it or whatever. That's fine. I think I'm, I'm okay with it as is. Same here. Hello. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I agree. So based upon that quick conversation, who wants to participate in the BRC co uh, conversation? Oh, are we going to do a Zoom? Uh, that, that would probably be the, the quickest and easiest. I will with someone else. I haven't worked with the BRC at all. I, I'm not familiar with their process. So I'd like to learn a little bit, but I, I, I'll piggyback with somebody else. I'll be happy to do it. Okay, I'll sit with you, Pete. If I'm available, I mean, is it? Can we can we all attend, it, or is it just what we just? I, going to I think we can all attend. I just want to get get get, okay. get uh, a feedback. I'll just uh, reach out to Bob and uh, say, you know, we're we'll um, just if you guys can just uh, probably end of this week, Friday or Monday. There's five of you, so two of you. 
can meet without it being a public meeting. So you could just zoom it whenever you want. Yep. Um, but if it gets to three, then it's a quorum of your group, which turns it into a public meeting, which again, is still easy to do via zoom. It just creates a different context. So however you feel is most efficient. BRC doesn't have that issue because they have so many members that they don't have to worry about quorum until they get to eight. Got so it. it's informal with two or three of them. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I think that makes sense then. If you, Peter and, and Chris want to take the lead and I'll be, uh, I'll be the backup if, if something happens that you guys can't make it or something like that. Yep, sounds good. Great, so uh, I, will, I will still reach out to, to uh, I will copy you as well um, to Bob and uh, so we can make sure that uh, we're, everyone's in the loop. Um, and like Russ was saying, then ultimately it doesn't need to get noticed or any of the other stuff that it can be uh, a little less formal uh, in, in that setting it up and, and meeting. All Very right. Good. Um, any new business? Do we, do we, did you, what do, you do we want to attempt to do the notes? Yeah, I did. Uh, it, it is I, the, the October. Yeah. When you say the notes, you mean the minutes minutes or, or something else, Rob? Yeah. Uh, the minutes from our walk, walk through. Yeah. I was able to scan them quickly. So I'm ready. I had one question on the, on the last paragraph. Right before number six. Yeah. Um, noted that progress in the library project demonstrated the value of an approach recommended by the FAC for another project. The use of a project manager. Who is who's their project manager? That's what are we referring to there? I don't remember that. Okay. Um, there was on the tour, there were three, at least three people identified um, from the library. There was Hope, obviously, as the director. Yeah, there, was the, a, there was the architect. Yeah. There, was a, there was another individual from the construction mm -hmm. company. And there was a third guy who was identified as the project manager who was working for one of the contractors. I don't know which one. He worked for Bowen Corporation. He was the, he was the project manager. And then the other one was the site superintendent for Bowen. So isn't that just so, a so, company? It's not really a separate project manager. Not separate. Yeah, that's correct. The way I read it, it sounded like it was a separate person. And Anthony Mento is the name of the architect from SMP. Okay. Our recommendation, and I believe we're talking about the, the Parks and Recreation Department, and I assume that was the reference that was made at the end of the meeting, um, was for a more independent entity. And, and you're absolutely right, Amanda, this, this guy doesn't represent that kind of independence. So I have to ask Rob, if since he was the one who, who, who raised the issue of the project manager at the library being kind of following our recommendation you just want me to fudge the words uh so typically when you have even dpw does this is they have a clerk of the works or a owner's project manager that represents the they represent the owner and so that's a more traditional method so that what happens is is that there are people who are trained in like processing the construction um, uh, requests for payment. They go through uh, any of the um, procurement portions of the project. They uh, basically try to make sure that anything that's a change order uh, has been evaluated and approved by the appropriate people. So that's, that's a, uh, and then they serve as independent eyes on the construction site during construction. Rob, was your point more that, that they needed that person on this because- I think it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's a good idea to, to protect, yeah. especially when you're talking about, you know, four and a half, five million, you know, these projects are not small projects anymore. 
and uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things going on and for someone like hope to be managing it on her own um, without some sort of guidance yeah. is... if, especially if you don't have a okay. person that's in, on the in the organization that does that already right so like public works as an assistant okay. engineer or others that do that project management or building projects that doesn't seem to exist. Sorry, I'm on. Okay. Mute. If you guys want to evaluate um, the uh, contracts, I'll send them along to you if you want to look at them. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I don't need to see the contracts. I was, I think I just, as far as, as you get into these little bit more complex construction projects that are outside DPW, I just think it's a good idea to get, and this, yep. this actually this costs more money, right? To hire an owner project manager or a clerk. Yep. Yeah, no, okay. and, and, so, and, I, and I meant that in a positive way. I'm, if you want to look at what we do, I, I'm always willing to get feedback. If I'm, I'm happy to have you guys look at it and go, Hey, this is what, this is how we structured this project. This is, these are our thoughts. I'm, I'm okay with that. It's public record anyway. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't yep. matter. Yep. Sure. Okay. But in terms of what we, we now think Rob meant, we were pretty happy with the progress on the library project. And, and yet if, if we're going to say that we're in essence, I'm going to have to cut out the reference to the progress, the progress on the project. Otherwise we're going to look like we're contradicting ourselves. We can't say the project's making great progress and oh, by the way, they needed an independent project manager. I would, so, I would agree with that. So, yeah. so, so I can, I'll schmudge it and, and I can send, do you want me to send it back to everybody? Now, again, if I do that, we have to have another meeting to approve it. No, I'd say we, can, I'd say can we, I ask, so Peter, I would, as if we, I would entertain a motion to, if there's no other comments about the meeting minutes that um, we make a motion to strike the section that talks about the progress of the project and any of the project manager recommendations um, from the meeting notes. So just cut the entire paragraph out. That's, I, I, I would, and someone has to, if someone would make a motion to cut that out and we could uh, approve the minutes if that is cut out. So move. All in favor? Do we get a second? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Let's say Aye. It's, 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 I'll go back through. So, Chris? We, yes. Peter Lennon? Yes. Amanda Kelly? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Mark Layton? Yes. Okay. Great. I think we get everybody. Great. So the entire the entire um, paragraph will get struck, um, and then I'll post. It. I'll take the draft off it and send it to Pan to post. Um, because we haven't had the meeting with the budget committee, obviously we're way premature on discussing any kind of draft letter. Don't you think? I uh, yes, I think that would be for us to do. And I uh, we have a. When's the, uh, David, when's the completion of that, the BRC piece or Russ? I know the 21st is their last. They're, um, I, I can get the committee their schedule. They're uh, dealing with the DPW budget. I believe it's late October, but I will, um, I'll get you a defi definitive date on that. Do we have, t we have time, Peter, to, to, craft the letter and, and submit it. Right, right. I mean, we don't have a lot of time based on what I thought was their schedule uh, for October. But yeah, we do have, obviously, we, 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 we need to obviously hear from them and they need to hear from us because they obviously could change the letter big time. Any other new business? October 29th, by the way. I just was able to get it off the website. Thank you, Russ. Hey, don't go anywhere. 
I think I would say, is that a Halloween meeting? Come in costume? Costumes are optional, hey, you know. Yeah. Good stuff. So that's costume. their. So, Russ, can you send us the whole schedule? Um, if you have it, that'd be really helpful because if, if they're going to actually discuss the police and fire recommendations earlier than that, or they're going to discuss the DPW recommendations earlier than that, even if they have a separate set of meetings on the CIP, um, we have to figure out whether or not we want to get our letter to them for those discussions and not wait until the absolute last meeting on the CIP. Yeah, C CIP is November 17th, so that's pretty deep. Oh, okay. In the schedule. Yeah, great. Excellent. Russ, can you send out the um, revised list of the sort of RFP items? I'm not sure what's on that list. Uh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you ask for Amanda? I'm sorry, I missed it. I don't know the name of the document. Um, what, what the, the, the outline that Russ? The outline that Russ was editing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Safety. Great. That's the public safety facility RFP sort of framework. Framework. Document. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm happy to do that. So uh, for our next meeting, obviously one of the agenda items would be to uh, discuss the recommendations or any changes to the recommendations for the public safety and uh, DPW. Uh, any other agenda items that we wanna cover in that meeting so we can get ready for that. I know there's some things that we've said we were gonna do. So <laughs> I don't have any more agenda items, Rob, but it, is, it, I, it looks like we have, a, at least on my calendar, for next Thursday, the 22nd. Is that accurate? It's, yeah, I mean, that's still on that, uh, that Thursday schedule. Okay. Does that seem too soon? A little bit. <laughs> I could, we could, uh, I could modify that schedule and send it out for, um, well, it might be helpful to have us have that meeting with the budget committee reps right before we have our next meeting. I agree. Yep. And also, if, if Dave's going to be able to talk to a couple of consultants and get a better idea of costs, we can with so, Dave. Yeah. After that. So. so if I push it for two weeks from tomorrow. Can we also, will, we, will we want to talk about anything from the um, ADA study that was going to get sent out or are we just going to sort of have that in the back of our minds. That's a great one for uh, maybe our agenda item, Amanda. So I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly when we're going to get that. So I'll, I'll keep, I got to look, I got to revive it again. I might have to talk to the consultant because I remember having a couple of questions about some of the stuff they put in there. It was kind of like a, you know, final draft when I got it. And then that's kind of when it all went. So I got to, I got to revive that. I'll, I'll get it to you, but I can't, I, I don't know. I mean, I can send you one now, but I, you know, it's, it's public, but I, I, you know, just assume wait and talk about a final, you know, draft that the town agrees with. Sure. So, Dave, we have a, if we have a timeline for that, then we can talk about what, if we're going to put it on the agenda for the next time. So if you think within a week or two weeks, is that going to be too short? I think that's too short. Okay. I, I really do. I, I do. Okay. The other stuff with contacting the other, you know, with the other things, I, the priority is getting the number for the CIP for the scope of work and talking to those with the public safety complex. I would, I would say that's a little too short and plan for the meeting after that. Okay. Um, well, if anybody thinks of anything, just send me some notes and I'll uh, put them into our agenda. So for our next time, uh, and I will re uh, reissue the invites. Uh, and kind of change the phasing of them so that they're more in alignment where we are in our schedule, if uh, that works for everybody. Great. Rob, are you going to contact the BRC chairman? Yes. And then, yep. okay. So you'll I'll do that first. Tom, and I'll copy uh, you and, and Peter on that. Okay. I'll copy everybody else, actually. So, but I'll let them know that you two are uh, designees. 
Great. Sounds good. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Peter. Second. <laughs> All right. Second. So moved. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Yep. Thank you.